So next up we'll have uh, George Uttle. He'll talk about analyzing metrics like a data scientist, and he'll be pleased to know that somewhere in our bucket list there's an R exporter from what we have in Prometheus. Hello, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Georg Uttle, uh, and let's start with the talk, uh, analyze Prometheus metrics uh, like, a, like a data scientist. Uh, to my person itself, so to put uh, everything I say into context, uh, me, I'm an, an enterprise software developer, um, having a background in data science uh, services and thinking around the last few years around the topic of uh, DevOps, uh, Dev development and DevOps. And, you know? Basically, I'm a developer who likes math, and I'm the second guy here uh, who will go to paternity leave in a few days. So. Um, my employee will be an eight-month-old toddler, and my daughter in next, starting next week, I would say. Good. The objective of this talk is um, I want to. I wanted in the beginning uh, pushing the limits of Prometheus, and I, I wanted to to know um, the, the models, the alerting models, um, the predictions I had in my dashboards. Are they good? Are they not good? Is there a way? Uh, to make it uh, better than I had done so far. No? And according to my background, I actually um, took the chance and tried to use some uh, data science methods and open source data science tools uh, to improve. And this was my goal and my aim, to improve uh, the rules and the alert model I have and the predictions I have. And like Prometheus, um, I wanted to bring a bit more light into the dark. Uh, I wanted to bring more. Uh, I wanted to bring more light into the dark of what's going on in the software we were monitoring, and um, this was my, my 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 objective when I started with uh, all this work. At the beginning, uh, um, an alert, a spoiler. Uh, this is about this is a topic where you could drift off into artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on. Uh, this is the warning. Should I do um, use uh, advanced mathematics and should I use advanced methods to uh, analyze uh, the data Prometheus uh, is gathering or not? The so rule of thumb, if you have a system that is doing well, you're getting alerts. You don't get uh, awake at night uh, without no reasons. Then keep it as it is. Stay with your rule-based systems. On the other hand, if you're not satisfied with your alerts, your rules, and your predictions, data science might give you some insight into how your data is structured and what hidden patterns are in your data that you could use and could exploit to improve your, your alerting and your data model. So, big thing. Where do you want you to be when you, uh, where was I, or where I expect somebody to be uh, when he starts to think about uh, doing further analysis uh, of the data Prometheus has uh, gathered? You already. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm about walking around. Um, I'm, I'm just did. So, but uh, what do you have when you start? You have the great architecture and the and the, and the great uh, quality uh, of data Prometheus is providing to you. You have, from a data scientist point of view, uh, only numerical data. Né? Yeah, you're happy. You can apply functions on it. These functions are good and help you uh, to create your alerts and your alert system. Né? You have this easy and fast and navigatable um, um, prompt QL language that allows you to, to, to inspect subsets of the data you have. You have the alert, you have the room model, plus you have this great uh, histogram visualizations of Grafana and the great um, um, visualizations Grafana is providing to you. One of the biggest things from my point of view is the introduction of, of these uh, heat panels and this uh, rolling uh, histograms over time with, uh, with Grafana 4.3, which already allows you to get some insight, insight how the, the data distribution, uh, how the data behaves over time. So I want you to start, if you have a running system, you have exploited all the possibilities there are, and you're looking for, I cannot stop. <laughs> <laughs> and you're and you're looking and you're and you're looking uh, and you and you're looking and you're looking for for some models to improve your uh, some ways to improve your model. No, good. Um, this 
talk, uh, the last next few minutes will be, we will structure as follows. I will show you how to get the data out of Prometheus into a format uh, that is used for, uh, for, for data science tools. Uh, and afterwards, I will show you a few uh, examples from my, from my personal experience that allowed me to improve the model, the rule-based model for alerting uh, that uh, is in place. No? Good. What to export? Um, you want to export the raw matrix data and with no functions uh, applied to it, and you want to export as much as possible without putting too much load on Prometheus running. So if you're querying and fetching your data from a live system, um, you could actually, if you grab all the metrics uh, via the, the um, API, uh, Prometheus can run into a timeout or just, just get killed. There are two ways to get data out of Prometheus. Uh, the one is using the HTTP API, and the other one is with uh, um, a polling mechanism. This is what uh, Grafana is using, um, um, and it's a very good interface to do some kind of exploratory data analysis. The second way to get data out of, of Prometheus is the remote API, which actually pushes data to an HTTP endpoint, which might be uh, very well suited for streaming analysis. In the further talk, I will only uh, and further uh, I will only talk about the HTTP API and leave the remote API as it is. So everybody who has used Grafana or the Grafana people will know this endpoint. Um, so Prometheus has this uh, API where you can do query by range. So you want to get, as you can see here, uh, you want to get uh, from Prometheus API um, basically all. Um, all metrics uh, having any name, you want to get them, and then you want to convert it uh, to a format that is actually useful for data science. No? Um, nothing big. Uh, the query range itself um, um, is an HTTP method, has like the query start and step. Step is somehow um, um, how often um, uh, data is. Um, 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 query it, and this response you get, you see on the bottom, um, a simple JSON file uh, for the use case of, of use case of, of uh, statistic analysis. We are only interested here in the result type matrix, or other types are not interesting uh, for this use case. And you get a list of, of metrics um, back with annotations and so on. Yeah, this is a good format. It's a JSON format, but it's not easy to use. Uh, in 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 a way uh, for for external open source uh, data science tools. No? Believe it or not, one of the best formats to have there is a comma separated value file. It's a tabular data. Uh, from my personal experience over the last few months, um, this basically is it. So you have an, a time column uh, where you store the, the timestamps. Uh, then you have a column for each metric, where each metric is identified by name, set of labels. Uh, and on the first row, you have an ID which somehow um, identifies in your identifies in your um, uh, data what uh, time series, uh, what the metric is. No? The easiest way to get this data out of Prometheus is to use Grafana. Yeah? Don't believe it, or believe it or not. Uh, in a Grafana dashboard, you can uh, create a query, display uh, the visualization, and then you can export it to a comma-separated value file. So you could also use uh, Python, uh, like I did, and do some kind of normalization stuff. Uh, but Grafana would be, for, for the beginner, uh, the first uh, entry point to get to a comma-separated value file that you can actually then input to R, uh, Python, SciPy, uh, or MATLAB if you want to have a paid solution. Good. Yeah, uh, uh, I jumped the gun. So the easiest way to export is, is Grafana, and the second one is, is Python. Uh, there is an entry from, uh, from, from Brian, uh, which actually shows you uh, in a simple Python code how to access the API. You can use it as a starting point and convert the data from the HTTP API uh, to your liking. Um, one thing when you export the data is um, you're soon getting into a position, uh, into, if, you, if you export all metrics into a comma-separated value file, uh, you soon get to a place where the CSV files become very large. Uh, so from a data scientist point of view, reduce the, the, the data you want to export uh, to really the one that you need. This query here uh, is a very simple query, which 
basically export all all data there is all metrics there are. No? Another tip. Um, when you are then later on losing machine learning technologies, um, you will need for supervised learning, you will need some kind of uh, annotations of your, your metrics. The alerts that are created by an ongoing system uh, are already some kind of annotation to your data you have, and you can abuse it to, to create your initial set of labeled uh, training and metrics data. Yeah. Another thing, we heard it before, and the, the, the uh, example of uh, at, uh, dupe is only uh, uh, using um, Gauss values. No? Uh, when you export the data and you want to further process this uh, with, with, with data science tool, when you analyze, want to analyze the, the, the math and the statistics behind it, when you do some kind of descriptive statistic, count Gauss are good, how we have pronounced that. Counters are not that good. Counters are only... Only, no? they don't repeat themselves. So best thing here is to do some kind of pre or post processing uh, like the, the guys before did. Uh, so you actually uh, convert uh, this counter into a gauge in some way. No? So uh, all different, you could do it in Prometheus. The problem with Prometheus is if you apply the rate function uh, to, a, to a time series, you lose the name of it. No? Then you have to figure out what time series uh, of what metric you, you selected, what name it was. So this is a complex, uh, not complex, but it's like something I, I didn't do. So actually use the functions provided by your tools to convert the counter to, um, to a gauge. Good, examples. Now uh, some concrete examples. I'm having the data in hand. No? I have exported it. Um, um, I, I'm at the limits of what I can do with Prometheus, and I want to get some additional insights into the data. I want to exploit it. I want to have some descriptive statistics. And now I will show you at least one or two examples how this uh, exploitation uh, of, of statistic facts can help you to improve your rules uh, and your predictions you have. Uh, the first one, these are artificial examples, so not, not fully based on real data. Um, but uh, here I actually uh, state I can predict the latency of HTTP requests over time. There is a function in Prometheus which already does some kind of linear prediction. Uh, it's called predict linear. You can, you can apply it to any metric you have, no matter if it's reasonable or not. No? Um, and Prometheus does not provide you any um, insight uh, if it works or not, other than you do it by try and error. So this example is about um, can I use uh, can, I, can I use the predict linear function uh, and can I be sure without trial and error that this works and in what boundary does it work and so why not? No. So basically, exporting the data in a CSV file, then using for example R. Here I, I have an export of an R R workflow which I most often use when uh, I used in the last uh, weeks and months when I actually want to know if the linear model prediction is reasonable or not. So you have the data, you export it, and the first row you see here, this LM here, uh, is the R uh, function that actually does the same like the predict linear function. It trains a linear regression models, plus, and that's now the interesting thing, plus it gives you some insight how well uh, this uh, prediction model fits your data. No? There's a simple function which is called summary linear model number one, which was here uh, generated over there, and then you get the list of, of uh, statistical uh, properties uh, of the data and your model, and if you are um, uh, a skilled data scientist, you can see at one glance if it's working or not. No? In this first example, I, I tried to predict uh, the duration of an HTTP request based on the time, which is, yeah, Captain Obvious stating not really working. No? So nobody would, I wouldn't have expected that this works. No? Good. Uh, then you get a lot of interesting graphs. You can interpret it or not, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, here, for example, is the QQ plot, um, which um, probably I might come back to the question how to, to size uh, the bins of an histogram. So if this, uh, this diagram, for example, uh, shows you if uh, can show you uh, if um, uh, if the, the data is normally distributed or not. 
why do you need that? If it's normally distributed, uh, then you actually uh, have specific rules how to, to size your bins of your histogram. Né? You don't need to guess, you don't need to do try and error. So if you have normally distributed data, uh, you can use this information to actually use the best possible bin size for your histogram or not. Yeah. Excel, for example, if somebody knows this program, uh, when you plot in Excel and, 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 and histogram, it assumes that the data is normally distributed, and then the number of bins is the square root of n samples you have. This is how Excel does it. No? Um, but there are a lot of insights you can get out of this data and a lot of ideas. No? So basically, here is uh, a plot uh, which is um, um, uh, residuals uh, versus leverage. You can identify outliers. Outliers are important, uh, are bad for the predictive linear model training because actually they are states which normally don't happen. So if you want to train a predictive linear model, you want to remove these outliers. Uh, if you actually want to detect um, um, errors in the errors in the application, then actually you want to search for these outliers. So this is in a nutshell, is it? Good. Um, how much time do I have left? Lots. Lots. Okay. Good. Um, so here, okay, my first hypothesis didn't hold. No, uh, I cannot apply the linear model uh, uh, based on time over, over latency. No? Good. My next idea would be, huh, what about uh, finding a correlation between uh, the number of requests and the duration? More, much more reasonable hypothesis. No? Uh, and uh, as you will see, we summarize it, you can see here, the F value is high, which is a good sign. No? Uh, and we can go across the, the, the plots again. And in the end, um, you will see here, um, here is the important thing, the scale on the y-axis. No? It's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not um, normally distributed, uh, but it's, it's less uh, skewed than it was um, um, in the first example. Yeah? So, and I also see some kind of uh, range where actually it behaves like a normally distribution. Uh, so I can see the boundaries uh, where it is, is sensible uh, to train and train the model, and I can filter out, which is also a quite important point, I can filter out in my rule models all points uh, or measurements that are above or below a threshold before I start to train a linear model. No? So you can use these insights to optimize uh, uh, to, to optimize the prediction of the linear model, and you use these insights from these graphs here uh, uh, to cut off data that you don't want to have, and to have stable predictions of whatever usage you are you're up to, and so on and so on. Yeah, good. So um, the second example I brought here um, is in the case you have a lot of metrics. If you see it, uh, where or something, you start with 800 or 900, no? uh, and you wanna you wanna ask yourself, are there some metrics in there that are well suited to predict uh, whatever incident, whatever state of the application I have? Are there ones uh, that are good or not? Um, the methodology I'm borrowing here from from machine learning is is called feature selection, which you typically do before you start to train your model, um, and before you actually do uh, machine learning. Uh, so uh, with this uh, method and uh, methodology, you actually answer the question, which of my metrics in this case are uh, the most predictive metrics uh, having at uh, most the best metrics to predict a certain state. No? How did I choose this method? Here I'm in the uh, SciPy world. SciPy um, is, um, if you don't know it, uh, SciPy is a machine learning toolkit from, um, from Python implemented. No? Here you have an overview of kind what, what, what thing you want to do. Um, you can no, go down here, and uh, if you read this detailed, uh, you will end up like I did uh, in a linear regression and feature selection method. No? Good. Then you have to do some things, um, remove seasonality from the data, um, bring the data in a format that it's uh, good for, for, for this analysis. And then in the end, this is the, the, the meat of it. Um, you actually have your data. Uh, you train, a rec here I trained a, a recursive feature elimination, um, and I get back um, the information, what of the features, uh, what of the metrics I used um, has the highest relevance to detect or identify uh, the alert I have I have before used for the training. Now I have this insight. 
From a practical example, uh, this could reduce uh, the number of metrics that you're looking at from 800,000, 20,000 to 10 or 20. So it reduces the complexity. Uh, and now you can actually uh, have a look at the remaining 20 or 30 metrics and decide for your own uh, if you want to change the model you have and use this better prediction data uh, to, to alter your model uh, or not. Then there are a lot of libraries around. The one which stuck into my head and which I was using um, sometime is like this TS Fresh library which does what I did here before, uh, automatically uh, you send to it more or less in the proper format um, um, a lot of time series, you give it some kind of uh, label annotation to it, and then actually it, 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 it selects the best features for you. Um, it <coughs> takes into account if the features metrics are dependent on each other, which is somehow uh, the answer to the question, did the developers um, 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 expose the metrics so that there are no overlaps between the information there is? And actually what it also does is like, if you have 800 metrics, uh, it extracts and creates 20, 30,000 uh, metrics using different mathematical functions and um, tries to see and uh, automatically tests uh, if these functions are also better predictors for uh, for the for the thing you want to detect or not, give it a try. You will see it's interesting and it will give you some insight into probably missing methods in in Prometheus that you might need to implement uh, or the similar. Basically, the the the, the mantra uh, that I was following over here is I'm created a hypothesis né, about your system and my metrics, how I could improve it converting the metrics to the right uh, format. You use some, some method from R and SciPy that you think might help you. And then, which is more the most important part, feedback uh, the results and the, 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 the insights about uh, how your data is structured uh, to your dashboards and your alerts. This can reduce the number of alerts. This could increase the accuracy, the precision, the recall uh, of your alerts. Uh, this could reduce the, the, the size of your, your dashboards. So it actually is a very good tool to reduce the complexity to detect errors in your domain. Domain is the software the microservice, whatever you're using. From my personal perspective, um, and lessons I've learned using all this machine learning and data science stuff, is like these descriptive uh, statistics that you can get out of data uh, of the, of the, um, actually help you to, to improve your, your, your model you're using for alerting and, and prediction. And it's the choice of you as a developer or an operations guy um, to correct this card or handle data differently or not. My main use case, my day-to-day -day use case I really like and I'm using and I would really, is easy to implement is, is giving an answer to uh, may I use predict linear function for my metric or not. Yeah? There is a simple answer to that. You don't need any try and error. Yeah, you can answer it by looking at the descriptive statistics of your data. Yeah? And personally, uh, I had no reason yet to do online machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other, um, other um, CPU, RAM, resource usage intense things. I was always good um, identifying some kind of um, statistical properties of the data I have and feeding back this knowledge uh, to, the, to the model uh, I'm using and keeping the resource consumption for this reason as low as possible. Mm -hmm. It keeps it cheap. Yeah, that's it. Basically, a summary of my uh, experience uh, using uh, machine learning and data science to improve um, my Prometheus model and uh, predictions that uh, are possible. Any questions? <laughs> so, 
So how do you feed back this data? You, you perform some analysis and then you got these values. So how do you send it back to alert manager or like how do you use this data? How do you use this analysis? Um, I'm using the facts I figure out about the data to actually improve by hand my rules that I wrote and to change the data that is displayed on my dashboards. So this increases uh, the accuracy uh, of my, my, my alerts, for example, and it improves uh, the, what I can see on the dashboard. Yeah. Ah, so it's not automatic. It, so it's no, like, you okay. could do it. This is also the reason why I'm here. No? So if somebody is interested, no, probably afterwards have a coffee. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, also point of order, if you could stand up when asking questions, then people can see you. Thank you. Yeah, excellent work. So I was wondering, you mentioned that you use uh, Python or R. What's the library that you use to pump it into, let's say, a data frame? Uh, is that your own library or are you using? And Richard also mentioned there's an R library yeah, for Prometheus. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> it's in the future. Okay. Okay. So, actually, so right now, how did you pump the data into the data frame, or did you? Use I wrote a Python script that reads the data, normalizes it. Like this is in the blog entry uh, of of Brian. He is just writing it to a I don't know where, but then you need to have the data at hand, and then you create uh, dynamically a data frame. Okay. And this data frame can be backed by a file or HBase or whatever. Yeah, you know, data frames are really really powerful. In, in where they store the data then in the end. Right, right. So I noticed in your other chart that you use Lasso. So Lasso, when you regularize, it automatically does the best prediction. But you use TS Fresh to find the best predictors? So or? TS Fresh is some kind of convenient libraries which parallelizes um, uh, this uh, whole stuff and does automatic feature extraction uh, from the initial feature sets metrics set. I have I also have to, to switch between the two domains, but which is, does some kind of feature extraction and then reduces the features again. So it's a convenient library that does a lot of things that most data scientists have to do on a day-to-day -day basis okay. when they're working with So it's using thing. Aramax and Aramar, those time series libraries? Yes. Oh. it uses internally the whole range of SciPy and okay. Co. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, so uh, I just had a question that I see that you use a lot of the uh, linear models, uh, but did you also uh, see some, uh, if you tried, uh, did you see some metrics which better fitted other models? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, can you give some examples? Yeah, if it's not linear and then you need, or you need uh, then it's not linear, then you need a not linear regression model. No? Uh, it's not implemented in Prometheus. No? And then you can think of, uh, if it's non-linear, no? <coughs> then you have to, to use another model to train it. No? And and yeah, and you have the whole uh, range of, of, of regression <laughs> models that are implemented inside. But, but are, are there metrics which you already saw uh, which do not follow a linear model? Um, the most metrics I looked into it so far only follow the linear model within a certain range of data. No? Yeah? yeah. So you have to, to cut it to, to one end to make uh, reliable predictions uh, at all. Um, and uh, in production or in live system, uh, using nonlinear models, I never came to that point. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Hello? Ah, yes, there we go. <coughs> Is it blinking? Hello. Ah, cool. Thank you. So that's that's super fascinating, and it's it's very insightful. The thing I'm quite interested in is, given that you now have a model, do you see a need, or do you see the possibility for using evolutionary techniques, reinforcement learning, grammatic evolution, etc., to better evolve the model that you currently have? Yes, yes, for sure. For, for example, the one, I, um, um, the, the example I gave, like um, extending the training set or having an initial training set by using the alerts you have. No? Uh, this is like, a, could be an, a pointer to a method how to extend your training data uh, with onboard methods from Prometheus. No? So I'm, I'm having a, a thousand ideas how to do that, no? but I don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> 